Rogers, the founder of client-centered therapy, has been a major contributor to the field of counseling for over four decades. A former president of the American Psychological Association and the recipient of its award for outstanding professional contributions, he's authored such important books in the counseling field as Client-Centered Therapy and On Becoming a Person. Since turning 65, he's written over 40 articles, and his most recent books include On Encounter Groups, Freedom to Learn, Becoming Partners, and On Personal Power. In this film, he turns his attention again to the field of counseling. With him for the interview is John M. Whiteley, a member of the Social Ecology Faculty and Dean of Students at the University of California, Irvine. Carl, what assumptions are you making about the nature of man from which you build your theory? Well, I think really there's um, one assumption which has become more of a uh, conviction based on experience for me, and that is that the uh, human organism is a trustworthy entity. Or to put it in other words, that persons can be trusted if you provide the right kind of psychological climate for them to open up and express themselves and, and uh, develop so that uh, it's, uh, it's assuming that the human organism is just like all other organisms in the universe, that it can be trusted to move in a constructive direction, providing there aren't too many distorting and warping uh, circumstances surrounding it. Well, within a person, then, is the capacity for growth if you can create an environment in which it can grow. That's now, right. writing three decades ago, you said that certain conditions were necessary and sufficient for providing for that change. From the perspective of being into encounter groups, thinking about men and women, writing on education and lately personal power, have you changed your view? I think that um, my uh, belief in those conditions of uh, empathy and congruence and, and uh, caring, as you want to call it, uh, has, has deepened, but it has also gone on beyond that. For one thing, uh, an increasing amount of research supports the fact, tends to confirm the fact that um, those conditions do tend to facilitate constructive change and growth. But I think I've also come to feel that to uh, place more emphasis on, on the person of the therapist being present. Uh, that you really have to be present to this other person in all aspects of your, of your being. And I don't know, I don't know if that's easy to define in intellectual terms. I know what it feels like when I feel really present to a person. And I think, I think they recognize that too. What does it feel like to you? You said you can have that feeling within yourself. I feel as though I'm all there and all with this person. Um, I'm not, um, not holding myself back. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, uh, well, one word I sometimes use is, I feel as though I'm kind of transparent at that moment, that the person can really see through me, can, there's nothing, there's no, um, I'm not putting up any barrier, I'm not mm -hmm. hiding behind anything. You're really being yourself. Mm -hmm. And really in, in that yourself. sense, one of your conditions being very genuine. Mm -hmm. What about anger, then? Is well, that anger uh, something you've written and thought about? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It's something that uh, has always been somewhat of a, problem with me. I don't express anger easily. Mm -hmm. But there I think that uh, my experience in encounter groups has helped me to be more free in expressing anger. Uh, for whatever reason, I really don't often feel, I don't think I've ever really felt angry in dealing with an individual client, but I have felt angry in groups mm -hmm. and um, uh, have learned to uh, try to express that anger when it occurs. What I usually do is, is uh, what I used to do and don't do quite so often, would be to actually be angry and not realize it until afterward. Mm -hmm. And I like it so much better when I can be aware of it, when I'm feeling it, mm -hmm. and express it toward the person or the situation that 
really arouse the anger. So I'm learning, but I still have plenty to learn. Is there a conflict between the genuineness you were speaking of and the transparency on the one hand and the caring on the other if you're really angry at somebody? That's why um, I put congruence or genuineness first. Mm -hmm. In other words, I think it's very valuable if you can feel a caring for this person. Mm -hmm. But if what you are at that moment is angry mm -hmm. at him, it's far better to be angry yeah. than to pretend the caring you don't really feel. And let them know that there's a that sharing of it is also important. That's the right. Of the relationship. That's right. Mm -hmm. In any close relationship, people always feel, I think how risky it is to share negative feelings with mm -hmm. someone that you feel caring toward. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet that is a constructive thing to do. What is it that you do that helps another person change their behavior? Uh, I think uh, what I do is simply to provide the climate we've talked about. But what brings about change in behavior in this other person is the gradual change in concept of self. That when the person comes to uh, see himself or herself uh, in a new way, say moves from feeling unworthy and uh, lacking in confidence and uh, all that, to a feeling of greater confidence, greater sense of worth, greater liking of self, then behavior begins to change as a result of that. Some of our uh, research quite long ago suggested, supported that in a in a modest kind of way, but, but I, I certainly have come to believe it clinically very strongly that changes in behavior uh, follow changes in, in uh, the way a person sees himself or herself and the way that he feels about self. Mm -hmm. and the client has some real choice about how to direct their own growth, I take it, which is a very different model than the behaviorist. Freudian That's true. Positive. I think that when, when uh, there comes about this change in feelings about self, then uh, you get a, um, a realization, I have a choice. I can behave in the old way, or I can behave in a new way. And this relates back to the first assumption we began with, that people have the capacity within themselves to make changes wisely and mm -hmm. growthfully mm -hmm. for them. Yes, I think that um, my experience has been that if I'm able to do a satisfactory job of providing these conditions that we've talked about, uh, then I can really trust the, the fact that the person will move in directions that are not only personally constructive, mm -hmm. but socially constructive. Mm -hmm. And if that seems, I know that seems strange to some people, why would they move in directions that are socially constructive? I believe it's because uh, of the species we belong to. Man is essentially a social animal and prefers to live in harmony with others mm -hmm. um, in spite of all the wars and rumors of wars going on. Mm -hmm. um, given the opportunity for free choice, he prefers a harmonious relationship with others rather than a disharmonious relationship. What do you do in terms of method when you're working with a client? Do you use confrontation as a, as a technique? I would say that uh, the times when I'm most unhappy with myself as a counselor are those times when I catch myself using a technique. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not uh, open to knowing about techniques. Mm -hmm. I'm open to using them if they feel so spontaneous at the moment mm -hmm. that it's not a technique. Mm -hmm. It's when, uh, uh, you know, take, I don't know whether you call this a technique or not, it's, uh, it's something that's very real to me. Uh, I've learned to trust my intuition. Uh, sometimes in the midst of an interview, something will crop up, especially if I'm quite close to this client, mm -hmm. feel in tune with this client, something will crop up in me that wants to be said, and it may have no relationship to what's going on. It may seem, from, from my intellectual point of view, totally foolish to mm -hmm. say that. But I've learned to trust it and to say that. Mm -hmm. And I would say, eight times out of ten, it proves to be something very meaningful to the client. 
you really allow yourself that same trust in yourself that you're attributing to the client. It's, it's, uh, it's been increasing. Mm -hmm. What about reflecting? I think there's probably been no aspect of your work that's been more singled out for analysis and mm -hmm. perhaps misunderstanding yes. than reflecting. What do you mean and what do you want people to understand about what you mean? Yes, there are statements like client-centered therapy is simply the reflection of feelings. Well, um, I don't know, we may have been responsible for starting that term, and so I regret that. Because the real aim is to understand the feeling. In other mm -hmm. words, I want to be a companion to the client and to be right with him or her in um, exactly what's going on inside at the moment. The only way I can find that out, whether I am being that sort of a companion, is to check it. Mm -hmm. um, is this what you've been trying to say? Is this what you're feeling? Mm -hmm. um, it sounds as though you're experiencing such and such. And if the answer is no, no, then I would drop that immediately. It's so that what is termed reflection of feelings is an attempt to check my understanding of what's going on inside the, the client mm -hmm. with his understanding of it and to to therefore correct myself so that I can go in the same path that he's following. So you do it both to correct yourself and to let the client know that I understand That's what right. you're saying. That's right. And it, um, it can be uh, a very rewarding and opening thing for a client to realize, my God, you understood that? Nobody ever understood mm -hmm. me before. Mm -hmm. I think that we have no realization of the fact the real empathic understanding is one of the rarest things in the experience of any of us. And to find that I bring out something, uh, that I as a client bring out something very tentative, mm -hmm. something I'm afraid of, something I've never told anyone else. And this other person seems to really understand it, not in a general way, but in its nuances and in mm -hmm. its uh, uh, delicate shadings. Wow, that's a tremendous experience. I'm no longer so alone. And, it, uh, and then it also means that I'm encouraged to say more. I'm encouraged mm -hmm. to go further into myself. If I can be understood at this level, then perhaps I could be understood at still another level. And there's one other function that it serves too, uh, that probably should be mentioned. And that is that to, uh, if someone expresses a confused and uh, difficult feeling, mm -hmm. do you have that... Uh, to find the other person understands it in somewhat different terms is often very terrifying. In other words, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that's what that's what I've been meaning. That's that's what I've been trying to say. And you see a look of real relief at mm -hmm. the at the greater clarification that uh, the client feels. What about insight? Um, insight is another uh, dimension that that's been talked about a lot. What is insight in your own model? Well, I think. Uh, in the earlier formulations, I used the term insight quite a lot. I doubt if I have used that for quite a number of years, because I think the much more accurate term, uh, the, um, no, not, there is such a thing as insight, but the more accurate change agent mm -hmm. is experiencing. I think, for instance, I recall an interview I had just recently, where a client wanted to express some of the uh, deep hurt that he felt. Mm -hmm. But he, he went all around that, describing it, talking about it, talk, and only for one moment did he let himself really experience that hurt. Mm. Now it's, until, it's when he can let himself experience the hurt fully, but then there's the, then there's the chance of sensing it at a gut level and really being able to change. That's, what, that's insight of a, mm, of a gut level sort. Mm -hmm. Well, I think everyone realizes, this is, this is often talked about, that uh, people can have all kinds of intellectual insight and it doesn't change their behavior or particle. Mm -hmm. They can know all about the causes of their behavior in their childhood and all the traumas they've had and so forth, and their behavior may remain exactly the same. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if they've experienced some deep feeling aspect that has been buried in the past, then you're going to find that's an opening to change. 
because having having an understanding of those feelings in an emotional sense frees one to continue to That's grow. Right. It's, it's as though uh, uh, if a feeling has been deeply buried and now I'm able to let myself experience it fully, then I can move on beyond that. Mm -hmm. Up to that point, it's been something blocking my development, blocking my forward movement. Mm -hmm. But if I can let myself realize, oh, I am hurting, and really let that soak in, then I can begin to let that hurt go by and move, move on to other, uh, other phases of existence. You've already pointed out how you're using experiencing this instead of insight. Mm -hmm. and that reflecting while you may have introduced it with one set of meanings originally, you have a, a very different mm -hmm. set of conceptions about what you mean and what that conveyed. Are there some other changes over the last several decades as you've broadened into encounter groups and uh, applied your thinking to men and women and to personal power that you would single out as important? One thing that comes to mind is that uh, I have become much more aware of the power aspect of all of these relationships, whether we're talking about teacher-student or therapist-client mm -hmm. or whatever. And I realize that the stance I take on that is actually a very radical stance um, that I try in every way possible, whether I'm talking about students or clients or... or uh, close relationships, like marriage relationships. Mm -hmm. My desire is to keep the um, power with that person, to mm -hmm. empower the person, not to, not to have power over, but to help mm -hmm. him sense his or her own power and begin to utilize it and, and uh, realize I do have the strength and capacity to do things for mm -hmm. myself. And that to me is, uh, I say, I, it's... Uh, very different from most approaches because uh, most therapists, most teachers uh, have they have varying degrees of authority over the other person. They feel, mm -hmm. I am the expert and therefore I'll, I'll, uh, I know what you should learn or I know what's wrong with you. Um, and so it is a, a power relationship. Well, it seems to me in education you've, you've remarked that one person can't teach another person anything worth learning. And it seems that you hold that same model for individual growth right. as well. That's that, right. that in fact, the, uh, the realization of that came first in, in counseling because I started out uh, in times when, of course, the counselor's function was to tell the client what to do. Mm -hmm. And I was... Uh, it's interesting to look back on that and see I gradually drew back and drew back and drew back from that because it was so damned ineffective. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, so you moved away from it because it didn't work. That's right. Not because right. you'd somehow challenged initially no. the, mm -hmm. the knowledge is power, no. there's a professional mystique no. in counseling as a no. role. All those things came later but I, because I was uh, just as much uh, expert-oriented as mm -hmm. the next person when I started in. But I think I have always been quite pragmatic and have tried to follow up clients and follow up the um, learning process and students and so on and came to realize that uh, if I want to look very smart, mm -hmm. then play the part of the expert. That looks good. Mm -hmm. If I want to really um, foster a process of learning, mm -hmm. then empower the person and create a climate where a facilitative climate where mm -hmm. that person can learn the things that he or she needs to learn. Okay, so challenging really the power basis of our society's organization is one major change that's occurred yeah. over the last mm -hmm. several mm -hmm. decades. Would you single out any more? Certainly, um, I, I certainly can detect another change in practice, and that is that uh, initially, partly because I was so enamored of this uh, fact that the client did have capacity to move forward, and partly I think because uh, of my own insecurities in interpersonal relationships, 
I was more aloof from the uh, from the client. Um, I did try to uh, facilitate things, but keeping myself quite out of it. Now I would feel that I want to be there with my feelings too, um, but I don't want to. But my feelings, I like to own as my feelings, not as mm -hmm. something you should be feeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's a more personal, warmer, closer. Um, more intimate relationship, mm -hmm. really. And then another change I've noticed in myself is that uh, I am no longer so afraid of intimacy. I wouldn't have thought of touching a client during an mm -hmm. interview when I first started in. Now that comes very naturally. Mm -hmm. I think that's in part a result of the encounter group Yes, movement. it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel as though I've, the encounter group movement and being in groups myself has uh, helped me to, to change and grow. How, which gets to the next question I was going to ask you, how has your life been shaped in your own personal understandings, clarified as a result of your role as a counselor and a person who's thought about counseling very carefully? Oh, it's only changed every aspect of my life, that's all. <laughs> I would say that, uh, uh, as I recall, at first I began to realize if I deal with a client this way, why do I deal with a committee or with a staff so much differently? So mm -hmm. then I began to change some administrative functions. Then if I deal with a client that way, how come I don't deal with my children that way? Mm -hmm. um, how come I don't deal with my wife that way? I can't think of any aspect of my life that hasn't been changed by, uh, by my experience as a counselor. What I, would, what I would say to sort of sum that up is that I think one reason people are drawn to this uh, person-centered way of working mm -hmm. is that it is a person-centered way of being. It isn't just something you put on for certain mm -hmm. hours. It really is a, um, uh, a lot of convictions about mm -hmm. the way life is and, uh, and trying to live that way. How do you translate this to the goals that you'd like to see clients achieve as a result of working with you? This is very clearly a value question mm -hmm. and, and uh, mm -hmm. saying that counseling isn't value-free in its mm -hmm. most basic sense. What are your values mm -hmm. for clients? Uh, my one prime value is the, the person. And so if this, if this client comes out of the process, more confident as a person, more free as a person, more open to all aspects of their experience, and therefore more able to uh, choose intelligently among the behavior options and so on. Um, more of a person in intimate relationships, therefore more free to love uh, or to or to withdraw from a relationship if that if it's a hurtful relationship. But I would like that person to be as, as open to themselves and as open to the environment as possible. Then they will do creative things. I think they will find their life more fulfilling. Uh, and so it's a, uh, it's a goal which has no specifics. In other words, it isn't saying, so then they will behave in just this way or that way. It's uh, the kind of uh, inner sense of I am a free, responsible, potent person. That would, that would be what I would hope clients would uh, come to feel. Mm 